Welcome back, guys. We are now finishing up period two of the A-Push curriculum by looking at topic 2.7, Colonial Society and Culture. Let's talk about it. So our guiding question today is, how did the transatlantic movement of people and ideas create a unique American culture? So we've got ideas and people moving across the Atlantic. How does that create a unique American culture? Let's talk first about the population growth. America was a growing, booming uh, place. In the year 1700, there was about 300,000 colonists in those English colonies in North America. By 1775, the first year of the American Revolution, that number was 2.5 million. So a very, very rapid growth. Um, which makes you wonder, like, okay, why? <laughs> what is what is causing this eightfold increase in just 75 years? Couple reasons. Number one, more and more people were moving to the American colonies. Um, mo this was a, a, a combination of of, of um, voluntary immigration, and then there's also the situation of forced immigration, by which I mean, of course, uh, enslaved Africans. The second reason is Americans just had big families back then. Uh, you know, if you had five kids and they had five kids and they had five kids, I mean, the number really starts to add up very, very quickly. And so the population was booming. In fact, uh, the population was growing so rapidly that by 1775, again, the first year of the American Revolution, the average age in America was 17. 17, amazingly youthful population. Uh, here is the breakdown of uh, men and women, and then by age group. So lots and lots of young, very few old. There's a much larger view of it. If you're curious, okay, what does it look like in the modern era? Well, here's, these numbers are from 2015, but they're close enough. Here it is. Lots of older, not as many younger. So we are a much older population today than we were back then. All right, let's look now at some diversity. What's going on with our our people? Who are they? Where are they coming from? Well, there are two groups in particular we're going to cover today. We're going to look at uh, Irish, or Scots-Irish, as we're going to call them. Uh, the reason they're called Scots-Irish is they had started in Scotland, moved over to Ireland, and then from there they're going to head off to North America. So that's the Scot-Irish part. And then we have our Germans. Uh, these Germans primarily from the Swiss area down here, but also around, along the Rhine River in western what would be modern Germany today. So, a little bit of a, just basic facts about these two groups. Um, they both were about roughly the same percentage of the population by the revolution, 6 and 7 percent respectively. Uh, the Germans uh, settled uh, heavily in Pennsylvania. In fact, the Pennsylvania Dutch were not Dutch at all. Uh, they were German. That's, that's a corruption of the German word for German, which is Deutsch. They tended to be Protestant, um, mainly Lutheran, because of course, Martin Luther was German, but you also had some Catholics arriving as well, uh, Catholics from northern Germany. The Scots-Irish tended to be overwhelmingly Protestant, Presbyterian in particular, and the reason they're heading over to the New World largely is because of economic hardship. It was just not, not a lot going on in England or Scotland, not a lot of ways to get ahead, and so America seemed pretty attractive for that. On the German side of things, they tended to cling to their language and customs. In other words, they didn't immediately stop being German just because they were in North America. <clears throat> they had very little loyalty to the British crown because they weren't British. Same thing with the Scots-Irish. They didn't have a lot of loyalty to the British crown because Britain was built by conquest from the year, uh, from the English. The English had taken over Wales and then Scotland and then, and then Ireland. And, and so the Scots Irish don't really have a big love for the uh, British crown either. All right. So colonial makeup, you can see kind of who's living where and these various colors, the English and the green, Scots, Scots Irish, a lot of them heading out into the frontier. In fact, there's quite a lot of, um, belief that the uh, the southern accent of s southern United States of America today is uh, the result largely of those Scots-Irish settlers who came over many, many years ago and settled along the Appalachians. What's interesting about this to me is if you look at the ethnic population of uh, the colonies in 1775, again, the year the revolution begins, two things of note. One-fifth of the population was enslaved, okay? in less than half of the population 
was English. So we think of the 13 colonies as being exclusively English. Well, not even, okay? Literally, the English were a minority in their own colonies. All right, let's talk religion and society. So not only do you have reli or excuse me, uh, ethnic and, uh, and language diversity going on, you also have a lot of religious diversity uh, going on in the North American colonies. You can see how it's broken down over here. You've got Congregationalists, which are, uh, which is the new term for Puritan. The, the term Puritan was kind of fading out, and now they call themselves Congregationalists. So when you see that, think back to the Puritans we looked at uh, several uh, videos ago. Anglicans, that simply means they belong to the Church of England. Uh, Presbyterians, we talked about those a moment ago with the Scots-Irish. you got your Germans and so forth. And the Quakers, we've looked at. Uh, even, a, even a scattering of Jews and, and Methodists. Um, but that's, you're, you're going to have, in other words, you have lots and lots of religious diversity in this area. We're going to look at two, uh, we're going to call them religious rebels. And the first is a man named Roger Williams from 1635. So 1635, this is just, uh, what, five years after the Massachusetts Bay Colony got established. So it's in its very, very early days. He challenged uh, local church authorities, because Massachusetts Bay, um, you know, was run by church authorities in many ways, and so he's challenging the powers that be, and for his, um, his belief basically was that your religious practices should not be controlled by the local government, that that's none of their business, and he got a lot of pushback on this, a lot of, um, you know, threats, basically. And so he eventually left. He went um, further south, established a new colony we call Rhode Island. And there he decided that the people of Rhode Island, his new colony, should have complete religious freedom. Uh, and so uh, Rhode Island became this beacon of people who, frankly, didn't fit in elsewhere. They could go to Rhode Island and be safe. All right, our next religious rebel is also from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. This is three years after Roger Williams, 1638 now, and her name is Anne Hutchinson. So Anne Hutchinson was kicked out of Massachusetts Bay Colony for challenging uh, the, the teachings and the authority of the local ministry. What She had some pretty interesting ideas uh, that got her into trouble. Number one, she preached this message of something called antinomianism. And that's just a fancy word that basically says that your, your relationship with God, your faith in God, was what um, gave you salvation. In other words, what gave you your ticket into heaven. It was not good deeds. You can't be a, just a good person and get into heaven. You have to have that faith. You have to have that relationship with God. That was, that was something that local church authorities didn't want to hear. Plus, of course, she's a woman. And so here she is preaching, uh, that made the local authorities very uncomfortable. Um, she, uh, she also believed and she said, uh, openly that, uh, that God communicate, communicated with people, that God had spoken to her. And this is something that made people, uh, very nervous. You know, she's saying, well, God told me this. And, you know, they're all thinking, what? What are you talking about? And so eventually, uh, she was kicked out of there. And she went to uh, Rhode Island, by the way, where Roger Williams was. Uh, unfortunately for her, however, uh, she was later murdered by Native Americans in Rhode Island. Uh, as a side note, we were talking earlier about large families and growing population, what have you. Uh, Anne Hutchinson had 14 children. 14. It's a lot of kids. All right, this brings us to um, one of the most important topics in period two. It's called the Great Awakening, and this is going to have a lot of ripple effects down the line. In fact, there will be a second Great Awakening we'll talk about in a later period. But let's get some background. What was the first Great Awakening? So as we get into kind of the first half of the 1700s or so, what we're seeing is that the, the original fiery religious zeal that a lot of American colonists had had, in fact, had often brought them to America, had begun, begun to die out. After a couple generations of being in America, people had gotten kind of uh, used to, maybe even complacent, maybe even lazy when it comes to religion. And so it was decided that we had to do something to get people back on track, that we had to get people back in the pews. So if religious feelings are starting to wane, you think it's time for a revival. And that's what the First Great Awakening is. It's a giant 
revival. And its origins go back to the 1730s. And um, this is something that's going to spread um, just like wildfire across all the colonies. There are two figures you need to remember when it comes to the first Great Awakening. The first is a man named Jonathan Edwards. Uh, he was a guy who, like uh, Anne Hutchinson, uh, preached this message that your faith, that your relationship with God, God's grace is what saves you. It is not good works. So you can't simply uh, do good things and be a nice person. That's not good enough. You have to have the grace of God. He very much liked to paint the picture of what happens when you didn't have God's grace. Uh, he preached a message uh, in which he gave you very uh, detailed images of what hell looked like, of the fire, of the misery, of the, of the suffering, of the pain. In fact, uh, his, most famous, uh, uh, his most famous message is sinners in the hands of an angry God. It's his most famous uh, sermon. You can see that there on the right. Um, by the way, just random off-topic thing here, uh, Jonathan Edwards' grandson was none other than Aaron Burr. And if you are a Hamilton fan, you know who Aaron Burr is because Aaron Burr shot and killed Alexander Hamilton. Again, Burr was Jonathan Edwards' grandson. All right, the second historical figure to know about is a guy named George Whitefield. So Jonathan Edwards was from the colonies. George Whitefield was actually from the old world, from England. He came over to the new world. He was a great speaker, very charismatic, very persuasive. Um, he really um, did a great job of emotional appeals, of really tugging at your heartstrings and making you feel like you had no choice. You had to go and um, get right with God now. Otherwise, uh, you know, tomorrow could be too late and you'll be in hell forever. So you better get saved today. Now, when we're looking at the, um, the first great awakening, we need to think about not just its characteristics, but its effects. And what we see is there's kind of be, going to be kind of a division in terms of religious beliefs and, ta uh, and um, doctrines. You have a, two groups that come out of the first great awakening. You have the old lights and the new lights. The old lights were more traditional, were set in their ways, kind of probably older generation. They were skeptical of these, these revivalists and all their talk of, of faith and grace and um, you know, hell and all that stuff. And then you had the new lights, and the new lights were, were emotional. Uh, they liked the 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 um, the energy of the revivals. They liked being able to convert souls in a very dramatic fashion. So again, old lights and new lights, and because of that need for um, more preachers and ministers to fill um, jobs, as more and more people became religious. Schools were established to train this new generation of new light ministers. And you can see the name of a couple of the schools up here, which were established during this time period. Those four schools are, of course, very, very prestigious schools uh, today. The First Great Awakening was a, a spontaneous event. It wasn't something that was planned by England. It wasn't even planned by anyone here in America. It just kind of happened. Today, we would say it went viral. You know, it just spread like wildfire. Everybody's into it. Everyone's talking about it. Um, and it just became the thing, basically. All right, our next topic is called increased anglicization. Increased anglicization. What in the world does that even mean? Well, the anglicization refers to, of course, English. So when we say anglicization, we're talking about basically becoming more English. And what we're looking at is those, all those British colonies, whether it be Massachusetts, North Carolina, Delaware, whatever, they all had unique characters. They all had unique features that made them different than other colonies. But as the 1700s roll on, what's happening is those unique character, while, while the unique character is not going to go away, it's going to be lessened. It's going to become more standardized, more English. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one would be the fact that there's so much intercolonial uh, trade. So, you know, if you were a trader in New North Carolina, you might visit South Carolina a lot. And you might pick up on certain things. They might pick up on certain things from you. And so culture begins to kind of spread and standardize. 
you also had what we call transatlantic print culture. So uh, I might be I might be a German immigrant living in Pennsylvania, but I've learned English and I'm reading now books that were printed in England, and so are my neighbors who happen to be English. And so we're all kind of reading the same things, becoming uh, culturally similar. This would all tie. This would also tie back into the First Great Awakening, uh, with the growth of the Protestant Church and the revival and the excitement and the emotionalism of, of the First Great Awakening, we're going to see um, you know, a movement towards more religion and kind of a standardized religious experience. All right, our next guiding question is, how and why did the goals and interests of British leaders and American colonists begin to diverge? In other words, why are American interests and British interests beginning to split a little bit? What might explain that? So let's first look at some examples of divergence, and then we'll talk about some dissatisfaction that may have led to that. We've covered mercantilism earlier in a previous video. This is the idea that um, that that uh, power is equal. Power is measured in wealth, and wealth is measured in gold and silver. The way you earn gold and silver is by exporting more than you import, and to export more than you import, you have to have colonies to provide the raw materials, also market for your colonies. So that's a quick review of mercantilism. <clears throat> As we talked about, Americans didn't always like being on the junior side of the mercantilism policy. Then you had the Navigation Acts, which strengthened British mercantilism, which regulated who Americans could trade with. That was a sense, that was a source of uh, divergence, a bit of a sore uh, spot. Then we looked at Bacon's Rebellion in a previous video, where uh, the frontiersmen were fed up with the local government and decided to try to overthrow it. Then we also looked at the Dominion of New England, which was established to better enforce the Navigation Acts, which was later overthrown by the American colonists. So we've seen some examples of pushback from the colonists already. So what, what would be the source of dissatisfaction? Where, where is it coming from? Uh, some of this is uh, territorial settlements. In other words, some colonies uh, had claims on other colonies. Um, in a much earlier video, we saw a map where uh, Pennsylvania and Maryland had competing and overlapping claims. That led to dissatisfaction. A lot of frontiersmen felt left out, felt like they were kind of just left out there on the vine to wither because they weren't being fully protected against Native Americans by the colonial government. Then, of course, there were also limits on self-rule. For example, during the Dominion of New England, uh, town meetings in New England were shut down, and that was something that New Englanders certainly didn't like. So this brings us then to colonial resistance. What are some sources of colonial resistance to British control? One, distance. Uh, it's couple thousand miles across the ocean between uh, American colonies and England. That's weeks, if not months, by sea. Um, so just distance uh, is going to become an issue. We had um, kind of learned as colonists how to run our own government. We didn't want the British looking over our shoulder. We didn't think we needed them to look over our shoulder. So we had experience with self-government. We felt confident that we could do this without British help. There were ideas of liberty that were starting to emerge. We'll talk about that more in just a second. There was also incredible ethnicity, ethnic and religious diversity in the colonies, and which meant there were a lot of people who weren't British or didn't like the British in these British colonies. Another major source of colonial resistance is something you probably remember from world history. It's called the Enlightenment. and I don't want to get into all the details right now because we'll talk more about them in the next um, historical period. But the Enlightenment had all kinds of ideas of rights and freedoms and resistance to oppression and all these examples of what people could do and should do and what governments should be doing. And it inspired these American colonists. So how and why did the goals and interests of American and British leaders diverge? Well, we just talked about that, right? Geographic differences, philosophical differences, religion, ethnic diversity, you name it. Lots and lots of reasons why. All right, guys, that is it for this topic. It's also it for period two. Uh, two down, seven more to go this year.